If you are starting a vertical farm and don't know where to begin or which technology would suit your needs, then reach out to the experts at Cultivated. As indoor farm brokers, they help connect you to the right technology and ensure your project is successful. Best of all, their service is free because they work on behalf of their partners. Visit cultivated.com to learn more. And that's spelled C-U-L-T-I-V-A-T-D.com or click the link in the show notes. It's also very different between Canada and the U.S. In the U.S., as long as you say this hasn't been reviewed by the FDA, you can say whatever you want, right? We didn't say the FDA approved it. In Canada, it's different, right? Like if you want to market a natural health product, you have to produce it at a Health Canada site licensed facility. Welcome to the Vertical Farming Podcast, weekly conversations with fascinating CEOs, founders, and ad tech visionaries. Join us every week as we dive deep into the world of vertical farming with your host, Harry Duran. Vertical Farming Podcast, Season 8. Regular listeners, welcome back. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy days to hear these fascinating conversations with these amazing folks on the show. And if this is your first time listening, you're in the right place because this is the one where we speak to said CEOs and founders of the leading vertical farming companies from all over the globe. And I'm your host, Harry Duran. We scour the internet far and wide and through the connections I'm making at these conferences, which I'm really enjoying, I'm able to bring these conversations to you and at the same time, continue to learn and educate you about what's happening in the space. And I've been getting such good feedback from listeners and fans of the show alike. In case you missed last week's episode, we spoke to Marcos Enriquez. He's the founder of Isse Farmer, and he talked about his passion for bringing vertical farming to Spain and the work that he's doing to get his company started there. This week, we speak to Jonathan Murray. He's the co-founder and CEO of Adapt Ag Tech. We haven't had a conversation around mushrooms on the show for quite some time since way back in season one when we spoke to Andrew from Smallhold. So I was really excited. I connected with Jonathan briefly through the team at Cultivated, and I've been watching their progress from afar for quite some time. So it was really exciting to finally get to sit down and have a chat with Jonathan. He's got such an interesting background in banking, clean tech, defense, and med tech, and he shares how he's leveraged his experience to not only navigate regulations, but also to find solutions to complex problems, which I thought was fascinating. We talked a bit about the concept of hyper-local environments and their hybrid business model, and also about their plans for expansion into the U.S. market. So much to learn here from Jonathan and their approach to growing mushrooms. And given the visibility in the space, it's exciting to track what's been happening here. If you're enjoying this episode or past episodes, we're due for a rating for me to read on this podcast. So please rate this podcast.com forward slash VFP and you can submit yours and get it read out by me. Just like in the olden days when you used to send a request to the DJ to play Duran Duran (laughs) and then hear your name mentioned, but I'm probably dating myself with that reference. Again, rate this podcast.com forward slash VFP. I'd love to read yours out next. Don't forget to check out some of the newest projects we've got working, cea.events, for a listing of all events in the indoor farming space. Make sure you check that out. And as always, Vertical Farming Weekly to get updated. We've got a new editor joining us, Natasha, and she's been extremely helpful in getting me and us back on track with our weekly communications to you. So Vertical Farming Weekly, if you haven't signed up already. Okay, before we jump into this fascinating conversation with Jonathan, here are a few words from the folks that support this show. This year, Indoor Ag Tech is coming to New York City's Times Square, and it's bringing together the world's leading growers, retailers, tech providers, seed companies, and investors. Join us from June 29th to June 30th to meet, expand networks, and produce fruitful partnerships. The team has been gracious enough to provide listeners of this show with an additional 10% off of the registration. Simply use promo code VFP when you register and lock that in. And by the way, if you're on the fence, remember that early bird discount ends on May 11th. After a pivotal year for CEA, the summit will explore what's needed to ensure the industry can continue innovating and growing into a crucial part of the global agri-food supply chain. So Jonathan Murray, co-founder and CEO of Adapt.ag, thank you so much for joining me on the Vertical Farming Podcast. Thanks for having me, Harry. So sounds like you've got a lot on your plate today. So what's a day in a life like (laughs) of a CEO? Great question. Yeah. Great question. Every day is different. We're 
ramping up the team. So a lot of onboarding lately. The today was meeting with some chefs, meeting with a culinary school, call with investors, podcast now, major retailer call after this. So a lot of different areas, a lot of different sectors, but we're scaling up the team. So it's exciting that a lot of things are moving kind of uphill without my direct input lately, which is awesome to see. Yeah. Where's home for you? I'm in Ottawa, Canada, specifically Carleton Place, which is a small town outside. I, I spent the better part of a decade in Toronto until the start of COVID. And my wife and I, we wanted to to slow down and uh, you know move to a small town and have a backyard for the dog. And so we've become way busier, but at least we've got a yard for the dog. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Ottawa, so it was kind of coming back home and I've got family here. So my brother's got three young kids and being able to kind of see them grow up it was a major part of the decision to move back. So we're excited to be back in the hometown. I always talk to so many CEOs from all over the world at this point now. So it's always interesting because listeners are getting a feel for these different parts where people have grown up. So for people that are, are not familiar with that part of the world, what was life like growing up there? So Ottawa is the capital of Canada, major government town. So very stable, but a lot of people consider it quite sleepy. And if you have traveled the world, I think that you would agree with them. You know, it's uh, we do have Silicon Valley North, they call it. So Canada, which is just outside of, of Ottawa, it was kind of the, the starting place for like Nortel Networks. And like we've got major Nokia offices here, BlackBerry when BlackBerry was was a thing and kind of from that cohort of telecom companies after that boom went bust, some companies like Shopify were born. So Shopify is an Ottawa based company. And then there's a whole ecosystem around Shopify that exists now full of amazing, mostly software founders in the region. And it's pretty great tech hub. So you got your start in banking, is that correct? <laughs> Yeah, my first role out of school was in banking during the financial crisis. I worked. Good timing. <laughs> yeah, it was great. And I thought, like, oh, maybe I'll be in banking. Maybe I'll be an investment banker. And it was like, yeah, no, like, definitely not. This is uh, not fun. Quite uh, candidly, I was in collections. So it was bad time. I, it was a part time job I had in university nights and weekends that morphed into a little bit of full time. And then from there, I moved into to clean tech and kind of bounced around from industry to industry from there. So from banking, I got a role at a clean tech company called Clearford, which did wastewater collection and treatment. So you talk about kind of speaking to founders all around the world and kind of making their way back home. I traveled so much in my early days of my career, like India, China, South America. And my mom was always worried that I'd, I'd end up halfway across the world. And she's like, no, just start your family in Ottawa. Um, so I, I made my way back to Ottawa. So we did the clean tech thing with them. And then from Clearford, moved over into the marketing side and worked for a defense company called Senstar. And I was in my early 20s. And I have no idea how I got the role, but I became the director of marketing okay. for their company. So I managed offices in seven countries around the world for them, went through a full corporate rebrand, I think it was just that they needed a completely different view of what they had been doing before. And they were like, let's bring in this young kid who knows first with social media and he knows what that is and he can get us YouTube videos. And <laughs> I think the pointed question that I had in my interview was like, what do you know about SEO? And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like SEO? And I, you know, like with the search engines, I'm like, oh, search engine optimization. They're like, yeah, how do we get to the front page? And I'm like, oh, this. And I like That's funny. listed off a couple of reasons. They're like, okay, yes, you're hired. So that was fun. And so I did, yeah, water, then defense, and then wanted to get back into the sales side of things. So marketing, you know, giving tools to the, the salespeople was great, but I'm definitely more of a front lines person. And so I looked, okay, what are the most challenging kind of sales sectors that we can get into? I didn't want to go back to banking. And when I did a Google search, the next on the list was MedTech. And so I jumped into MedTech, joined a company called Striker, which is kind of the, one of the biggest companies that you've never heard of until you hear about them, and then you see them everywhere. So they're into everything like beds and stretchers, operating rooms, things like that. So I got into a division called endoscopy, which was minimally invasive surgical devices and ran the Toronto region for that with some colleagues for about 10 years there. 
So that was, yeah, water, defense, <laughs> med tech, now farming. What was your take on being experienced to the outside world? Because in that clean tech space, you mentioned you started traveling and seeing other parts of the world. I imagine it was like your first experience being outside of uh, your, your familiar hometown. Do you remember if you can think about what it was like to start to an experience for other cultures, other ways of living? How, you know, for me, I remember it's the first time I went to Thailand. I was just like, just like, it just exploded my mind. And just like, just the, the concept of like a language that wasn't even like the romance based languages. <laughs> like it was like completely something different. So I was just, I'm always curious when people had that experience for the first time, like what it does to the senses. Yeah. So I've always been in search of travel. My dad worked for telecom companies here in Ottawa. And when I was a kid, he'd, he'd spend time in Taiwan and Saudi Arabia and all these places. And so you know, I always had that bug. My favorite place as a kid was like, I mean, for two reasons. One was it was the airport because I'd be go there to pick up my dad and be like, oh, dad's home. But then just the fascination of like people in this building tomorrow will be all around the world. Like it was such a crazy thing in my mind as a kid. So I've always had that travel bug. So in school, I did international business, spent uh, nearly a year down in Chile, learned Spanish. So to, to kind of get circle back to your question about traveling for work, it wasn't my first time traveling, but it was my first time seeing cultures that weren't necessarily developed and the areas I was going to. I was working for a sewer company and I was going to areas that didn't have sewers, wow. right? And going to those types of regions was quite eye-opening, understanding the size of the world was kind of an interesting thing. Like, I think there's a lot of people in the city of Ottawa or the city of Toronto, and then you go to like Mumbai and it's like, there are so many people, <laughs> like, right? Like go to Shanghai. Oh my God, there's so <laughs> many people. Yeah. So I think that helped me open my mind to thinking about the scale of solutions that need to exist to tackle the biggest problems. It's like, yeah, solving your hometown is great, but like once you solve that, like how can that affect, you know, a billion people in a different region? What was it like? You mentioned how much of a hub Ottawa was for technology and communications. Did you get to experience or see what it was like? Because obviously there was a point in, the, in time where everyone in the world had a Blackberry. And I mean, I remember because I was in corporate for 20 plus years. I worked in banking. So it's just like I had the little Blackberry holster. And just like it was just like a way of life. Right. And then at some point it was interesting to see from our perspective, like how they were falling behind. And, you know, Apple enters the scene. And I'm wondering if, if you being from there, if you got to experience like firsthand what that was like to kind of sort of like be at, at the pinnacle of the world of technology and communications and, and then not be. Yeah. So like I was probably a little bit too young when like the Nortel kind of crash happened. But as a kid, like normally you're sheltered from that in general as like a kid. But it was like, you know, I was playing hockey and like the parents on the hockey team, like it was palpable, like the change. It was like, oh my God, like what's going to happen? And so, you know, seeing that type of like boom bust, I mean, it's kind of happening right now with a recession. It happened in 2008. The tech, the telecom bust kind of happened around like the dot-com bubble. So it was, I guess, 20 years ago, 23 years ago now. But the whole dynamic of the city changes, right? And then it takes a decade to get back up there. And in the case of Ottawa, you know, it was... It took Shopify to like really build the city back up from a tech side. Thankfully, like Ottawa, it's a government town, didn't really affect the economy of the city too much. The housing prices, like, you know, the federal government's here, but yeah, it's very, it's a challenge. And now being in industry, in kind of as a leader of an organization, having those thoughts go through my mind of like, I've got the responsibility of my team how do I put them in a position where they're secure? You know, putting them first is critical. And so it's definitely something that I think about all the time, all the time. Is there something in, in the water in Ottawa? Is there some, an entrepreneurial like <laughs> vibe that just runs there? Because it seems like there's a lot of maybe a disproportional amount of uh, companies that have gotten started. Is there something about the culture there? I think that having seen a company achieve success, right, makes you feel like you can do it too. And so there's also companies in Ottawa that many people have never heard of that have achieved unicorn status, right? Like I'll call it a couple like Fullscript, 
an incredible company that's a marketplace for naturopathic doctors that is basically runs all of naturopathy across North America. Might not have ever heard of them. Ottawa company, shout out Kyle Bratz. Then there's Ascent Compliance. My co-founder here at Adapt was the technical co-founder of Ascent. And they're a supply chain logistics software and compliance software. So you know, if you think about Rolls Royce, how do they make sure that their minerals they're using in production are not coming from conflict zones? These like really niche, challenging problems can be solved with software. And like Rob Imbo, it was one of the co-founders of that company. And so I think there's just a, a skill set that comes with the having a large corporation like a Nortel that goes bust. And then you still have the staff that are incredibly skilled. And what do they do? They become resourceful and they start their own thing. And one thing leads to another and they build companies. So you're at Stryker. I'm curious what starts going through your mind and the transition into forage, like how that starts to happen. <laughs> yeah. To be blunt, I just felt like I was working so hard for another company in a sales role. Like Stryker is fantastic. It's uncapped commissions. It's very exciting. But if you grow your territory too much, you know, they, they add, a, they add a, a rep to your territory. They split your territory. And so I just felt like if I worked as hard as I was working for Stryker for myself, that, you know, I, I could do something pretty cool. So that was the primary driver is like, I think I'm ready to take a chance on myself. Sometimes I say that it took me, you know, 15 years to unlearn how to be an employee and to take the risk on myself and be an entrepreneur. So that was a big part of it. And so getting into Forage, so Forage Hyperfoods was the original company that we started. So it's a wellness company in mushrooms, uh, obviously. And we identified a kind of a gap in the market where a lot of the products on shelf, especially in Canada, were powders. A lot of those powders were being imported and co-packed from China. And these mushrooms exist in Canada. Like, why aren't there Canadian products being put on the market? This doesn't quite make sense to us. And so we jumped into that, you know, quit everything, moved, lived in a rural motel in northern Quebec, worked on taking over a kind of a network of wild harvesters in Ontario and Quebec to build out you know, forage and, and receive all these wild harvested mushrooms. So shaga, turkey tail, reishi, and then some lion's mane. And, you know, when you're put in a position where the only thing you can do is, is drive forward and win, you know, you get scrappy. So uh, Chanel and I started doing that. We started doing quite well. Um, we launched forage as a brand. So foragehypefoods.com, vertical 20 for 20% off. And so a, a colleague of mine, Shane said, you know, you guys are doing pretty well. Like, why don't you raise some money? Like, why don't you grow this? And I was like, oh, okay. Like, I don't know how that all works. Let me <laughs> yeah. learn this. And so you go down the rabbit hole of understanding, you know, venture capital and fundraising. And that's kind of when I met Rob, my co-founder at Adapt. And we had breakfast and he said, yeah, like what you're doing is, is pretty cool. But like, what would you do with like a lot of money? Like, how could you solve a bigger problem? And I said, well, like, I think I do this. And we talked about like gourmet mushroom farming and ag tech. And I'd been interested in the space for a long time. I interviewed with a couple companies and met with a couple founders over the course of the last uh, decade. And just never was a good fit. And Rob was like, why don't we just do that? I was like, what? Really? <laughs> That's so <possible. laughs> he, he, yeah. So he was an angel investor to start and joined as a full-time volunteer. Okay. And over the course of the next year, we built out our MVPs. We launched the market. We signed up a couple of major retailers and it's led us to today. We did a small VC round recently. Rob's on full-time and we're starting to scale up our team. What was the biggest learning curve for you? Maybe in moving from Striker into the, the mushroom world itself, because that's its own thing, education, the medicinal properties of it, you know, how to market it, how to package it, how to, how, you know, source it, get it to folks reliably. And then another world opening up when you get into the ag tech space. Great question. So my first boss out of school very early gave me a, a lesson. He said, it's just not, it's not that you're stupid. You just don't know anything yet, but you'll learn it. Right. And so I've always kind of had that mentality going into a new industry and like, how do I learn about this as much as possible? So for Stryker, 
I don't have a medical degree. I don't have any medical background. Like my brother is a kinesiologist. Like I have nothing. I'm just a sales guy, right? Yeah. So how do I learn? And that's when I really started digging into peer-reviewed journals and studies associated with, you know, sports medicine repairs, different anchors, different the composition of implants, right? Like what's HAPLLA? Like how does that reabsorb into the bone, right? Like how do these complex you know, concepts, how can I use that to my advantage to get in front of surgeons and get in front of doctors? And I took the same approach to, to mushrooms. So first step was let's do the research, right? Like a lot of anecdotal evidence, right? Like mushrooms are great, cool, but are they? Let me dig into the, the peer reviewed journals. Let me understand what the values are, what the benefits are, how to get those benefits from those mushrooms right? It's not about, you know, taking some turkey tail off a tree and eating it. It needs to be extracted. How does that get extracted? Well, you dig into research, you dig into these papers and you find, okay, that's the extraction mechanism. Then I, I actually reached out to one of the, the researchers at the University of Beijing and said, hey, you sourced like this type of extraction. Where'd you get this device? Well, this company out of Germany. Okay, let me contact them. One thing led to another. Yeah, going down this rabbit hole of how do I get access to this? And so now we have wild harvested products that we send for third-party lab testing, confirming the, the active compound levels of polysaccharides and beta-glucans. How do we extract that dual solvent extraction with ultrasonic assistance? Then we put it into bottles, then we get it tested, and then we get it on the shelf. And in between, you're regulated with Health Canada and Canadian Food Inspection Agency and all these different kind of governing bodies that try to slow you down as much as possible for the safety of everybody, obviously, but it's just hoops to jump through. And once you get to that other end, there's, there's great opportunities. It's just, they make it really hard on you. <laughs> yeah. And I guess when you're in the world of medic medicinal or mushrooms that are for the, for the purposes of like improving people's health, you know, there's a lot of claims that are people making and, and a lot of concerns about sourcing, packaging, efficacy, all this sort of stuff. And it's, it's just sort of becomes a wild, wild west that someone's at some point, obviously, because you can make any claims and as the consumer, you're left to just sort of fend for yourself. And it's like, it looks, it's a, it's a pretty bottle. It looks like it has all the right ingredients. And then, but you don't know like where they're sourced from and, you know, how effective they're going to be in dosages and all that stuff. So it's, it seems like there's a lot to learn, but it seems like you sort of had that mindset about how to tackle this problem from, you know, what you mentioned at Stryker. And so it's interesting how you brought that to bear here and just kind of keep peeling away the layers of the onions like okay if this is coming from there where do they get it how do i use that and kind of putting all the pieces together which i think is fascinating it's for sure it with the with it's also very different between canada and the u.s in the u.s as long as you say this hasn't been reviewed by the fda you can say whatever you want right yeah. we didn't say the fda approved it in canada it's different right like if you want to market a natural health product you have to produce it at a Health Canada site license facility. To get that, a lot of red tape. And then every single product needs its own natural product number and PN. To get through that, it's a long process. And then once you actually have that product, actually can't make any claims. You just have to like hope that people know what the product is, right? So that's something from a marketing and kind of retailer perspective is like, what can we say? Can we put up science? Like, no, you just kind of have to <laughs> have it set on the shelf and and then you go kind of upstream of educating people and, and hoping people learn more about the product. And that's where, you know, rising tides raise all ships. It benefits us. So the fantastic fungi movie or movies on Netflix and where people are really learning about benefits of this is helping us, right? People see the product on the shelf. They say, lion's mane. Okay. Well, I saw that on that Netflix show. Let me Google it and let me figure it out. But on the package, you can't here. really say too much in Canada. There you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So... For people that are new to the space, and this will get us into the present time, how do you describe or how do you talk about the benefits of mushrooms for newbies? Yeah. So I was never a mushroom consumer from a food perspective, like as much as obviously am now, because I didn't have access to like creative ways to cook them, right? It, I had white button mushrooms in the supermarket, and that's what I thought mushrooms were. <laughs> yeah. Now that like, my mind has been blown with all the different varieties, all the different strains. You know, we're learning about all the different cuisines they're part of. We're being exposed to these incredible recipes with chefs. The way I talk about mushrooms from an adapt side is that they are 
a building block for a meal, right? It's much different as an ingredient in food production than, you know, like leafy greens and things like that, because it can be the focal point of a meal. So that's really what I talk about. We've also heard from retailers that they consider it closer to like a meat alternative in their stores than a produce. They don't think that we're going to compete with white buttons. They think we're going to compete with like Impossible Burger, right? And we're actually seeing that in real life. We're seeing that feedback on socials. We're seeing that feedback from different restaurants. We activated a new restaurant in the city of Toronto called The Butcher Chef. As you can imagine, a lot of meat at The Butcher Chef. And they're using mushrooms as a, an entire dish. It looks like a bouquet of mushrooms. And it's, it's a standalone main course. Like, that's pretty incredible to see. So, yeah. So you talked about this understanding of while, how to forage the mushrooms for the work you at Forage and, and like how to source them. And now, now this is a little bit different with Adapt because you're actually growing them yourselves. And so what were some of the, the changes or how was the thinking different in terms of like, I've got to go find and see where the best source of the mushrooms that are wild harvested for the work I'm doing at Forage versus I now have to like grow them myself because I'm, that is the product that I'm offering. And I'm, and I'm wondering, you know, what the thought process is around that. Yeah. So at the end of the day, it comes down to producing the best product. So for... For forage, the highest levels of active compounds, right? That was what our goal was. And in a natural environment, like wild harvested northern forests of Quebec and Ontario, those mushrooms like reishi and turkey tail and shaga, they're occurring naturally. They're pulling nutrients and all these compounds from nature. And through testing, we determined that that was in fact a correct hypothesis. Those have higher compounds. When it came to consumable mushrooms, it's not about active compounds, it's about freshness, right? Like how can I provide the freshest, most consistent, the tastiest product to either chefs or consumers? And that's where we started from a model perspective was freshness and consistency. So that's how we led into the container farming model for, for mushrooms. And so for to bring people up to speed and for folks who may not know, can you talk a little bit about the business model and what the current offerings are? For sure. So. Adapt, we are a producer of gourmet mushrooms. We operate in a hyper-local environment from our containers. So our units are typically located in dense urban environments, downtown Ottawa, Toronto, Vancouver, as far as Austin, Texas, and we're launching into different regions now. And we fruit the mushrooms as close to customers as possible. So our operators on site harvesting daily, making daily deliveries, but then we're vertically integrated from a substrate production uh, perspective where we we deliver those blocks to those containers. So they're not doing everything in the container. We take a, all the complexity and kind of the high risk activities and perform them in a central location with our lab. Um, so it's hub and spoke. So talk a little bit about that life cycle and how a mushroom goes from the substrate, maybe if that is the start, if it spores, you know, how that makes its way along its journey into the container and then total time in the container, harvesting, what that process looks like, manpower needed to get that done, just to, so for people can get a, a sort of like end-to-end -end, uh, life cycle vision of what that's like. For sure. So um, the lab process is petri dishes and mycelium, right? So we're cultivating on agar, moving that into grain spawn that's been sterilized, well, grain that's been sterilized that gets you know, converted to grain spawn once the mycelium takes hold. Then that goes into substrate, which is a combination, depending on the strain, anything from soy and hardwood to coffee to coconut choir. I won't reveal too much about <laughs> what we're currently using per strain, but we're actively testing to ensure the highest yields all the time. Once that's colonized after a few weeks, and that depends on the strain, whether it's lion's mane, oyster, you know, shiitake takes months. Once it's ready to fruit, then it gets put into that controlled environment in that container and grows the mushrooms. So we're taking a different approach than a lot of ag companies. And it's not better or worse, it's just different, that we're not trying to eliminate people from farming. We want to actually bring more people into agriculture, right? Yeah. There's a big problem, and we can touch on that afterwards, about you know the average age of a farmer in North America is very high with very little transition plans for these existing farms. But how can we create a process that is 
easy to bring new people with very little experience into our circle to create agricultural businesses. In Canada, we're seeing a lot of like I like to call them cannabis refugees, where people have been a grower in one of these large companies that have have uh, you know kind of dissipated, and they're looking to apply their skills in a different way. And so for us, like coming into a container, it's actually so much easier to grow mushrooms in one of these containers than it is to grow cannabis. Like cannabis is very complicated. You have a little bit of mold or, or you know mildew, you're done. Whole crop harvest. For us, we just control the environment. We've got mobile apps set up. And they just wait for the mushrooms to grow. And most of their time is spent with our customers, right? So we're a customer-focused business. So that operator, they're spending maybe an hour or two a day actually on the mushrooms. And it's predominantly harvesting. So most of the other time, they're either making sure that we're doing our global gap checklist, cleaning, all that certification that we need. And then spending time with customers, making deliveries, activating new customers, selling growing that territory, educating consumers. So that's really where, where their time is focused. Talk a little bit about the model. Or is it a hybrid model where some of these are adapt, owned and operated? Are these independently owned? Is this like a franchise model? And this, do people take ownership of the container and then you support them for anything they need going forward? Yeah. So what's great is like we're early enough that we're, we're exploring everything. We are definitely owning and operating in major territories. So like a, a Toronto or a Miami or an Austin or something like that, where we're owning the container, we're hiring our operators and they're selling into restaurants. With that, it creates an opportunity for people to essentially build a business without the risk of having to put everything behind it. Our operators have uncapped commissions. You want to grow your territory, like we'll add another container. In Ottawa, we went from a 20-footer to a 40-footer. Now we're talking about a second 40-footer for operator here, right? Like, And we're not capping this. Like, Grow your territory, grow your business. We just want to support you. In other regions, maybe smaller locations that wouldn't necessarily make sense for us to own and operate, we're definitely open to selling the, the units and supporting them in a way. I like to stay away from the, the term franchise. There's a lot of uh, <laughs> rules and regulations and laws around franchises. So we're not franchising, but... I like to say we're creating a platform. And so this is going to be a callback to earlier in our conversation about Shopify. So Shopify created a platform for people to be able to start businesses really quickly, right? So I want to start an online store. I don't need to code anymore. I don't need to build my store. I don't need to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars for a developer to do this. It's a plug and play. And that's what we're doing for urban agriculture. We have a model that we can plug this unit in and within seven days, we harvest our first batch of mushrooms. And that's a real timeline. And so for an operator to come in, we just need to make sure that they're willing to put in the work. They're willing to understand what it takes to be a farmer. And if they are, like, so let's set them up for success. We'll give them the tools to do it. But what's interesting from a mushroom perspective, Harry, is that we're seeing a lot more existing businesses reaching out to us. So someone's a small grower in a location. They're saying, listen, I got into this to grow mushrooms. I didn't get into this to be in payroll and deal with IT, right? And work on supply chain logistics. I just want to grow mushrooms and deliver to my community. So, you know, I've got an existing client base of 30, 40 customers. Like, do you want to come in and like, we'll use a container. You can supply the blocks and I can keep running. And that's what we're seeing as a really interesting thing. And I'm glad because I didn't want to be perceived as a business that's going to eliminate small growers, but I want to enable them to grow bigger. Right. So for a lot of these individuals to get into a major national retailer would almost be unheard of. Right. It wouldn't make sense to go through the process of global gap. It wouldn't make sense for a retailer to say, hey, you're operating in, you know, Arm Prior, Ontario, Canada. Yes, you can supply to that Loblaws. Right. But with our model, we're now in Loblaws. We're now in a major retailer. We're in be on board with Longos and we're meeting with Costco Canada, we're meeting with these major retailers and they're saying, okay, well, you can activate this next region as long as they're following your SOPs, as long as they're following your processes, they can start putting products on the shelf, right? Okay. And we can all enable them through the same EDI system and work with you that way, which is an incredible opportunity for, for existing mushroom growers. What's an investment look like for like a first time farmer who's looking to partner with you guys? Well, it depends. Yeah, as always, yeah. <laughs> so I'll talk about like timing, right? So 
your investment is like, this needs to be full-time. This is not a hobby. We're not looking to place a container for someone to be working nights and weekends. Like this is our everything. And so the commitment is, you know, willing to be an entrepreneur in your own right and put in the work to build your business. That means things are going to go wrong. You're going to have to work on solving them. That means harvesting on the weekends if the mushrooms are ready to harvest. So the commitment is willing to become an entrepreneur. And the upside is we'll help you grow your territory as big as you you want, right? And talk about your entry into the States. I know you mentioned Austin and what are plans for that look like? Yeah. So Austin, we've launched our container. We're operating there. We looked at Austin because it's one of the furthest locations to operate. And so as we were going through, you know, some of the fundraising investor conversations, they're like, yeah, but like when you start to go to the States, like you're going to have your eyes opened or, you know, once you get too far away from your central hub where you can't drive if something goes wrong, like I think you're going to run into problems. So the intention behind that deployment was, okay, you know what, we'll go as far away as possible and we'll prove that it still works and then we'll work our way back. And so that's what we've done. So operating well in Austin, we harvested our first cycle seven days after the container arrived. We're adding new customers weekly and the team there is great. And now we're looking at expanding to Dallas and then working our way up back into like Nashville and, and closer to Ontario. It was, it was a great uh, deployment. Yeah, very few challenges, shockingly, except for delivery of the container. We had to take down a fence. <laughs> when folks, when these finally make it to market, are they adapt branded mushrooms? Is that what the, the pack, is that packaging shows up? I'm just curious as like, you know, th- th- through all the, the installations that you have, like when they make their way to the, the customer's plate, you know, are they, do they know that they're eating adapt mushrooms? So we don't ask for that. Some chefs give us, you know, a nod and they either have adapt grown mushrooms on them. A chef here in Ottawa calls them the 550 mushrooms. I saw that. Yeah. yeah. On social, you posted that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're grown 550 meters away from his restaurant. In retail, we have a different brand called Hardy Foods. So Hardy with two E's. And really the reason why was because Adapt Ag didn't sound like a a really consumer facing brand, right? So if we're going to be in retail, we wanted to change the way the mushroom aisle looked. Very colorful packaging, QR codes with recipes on them. So Hardy Foods is our retail brand and Adapt is really more like the technology and kind of platform side. And then for chefs, they get boxes of mushrooms, right? We don't, don't have our logos plastered over it. Our goal is really to enhance and promote our customers and our chefs, as opposed to, you know, pushing our brand too much. So if you do follow us on socials, I think they're all adapt to ag tech, um, whether it's Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, LinkedIn, and you'll see a ton of videos that we're producing for our chefs, right? Okay. Not a ton of like, Hey, look at me, look what I'm doing. It's like, Look at what our customers are doing. Look at this meal that, you know, Renre Rodriguez is producing. Look at, you know, this amazing meat alternative dish that this this chef came up with or Chef Joe from Coconut Lagoon. And we're exposing people to all these different cuisines from all around the world that have mushrooms in them. And like, let's elevate them, right? And not us because, I mean, it's a trickle down effect. I'm not naive that if their restaurant does well and people order the mushrooms that our, our volumes will go up. But my goal is to elevate them and provide our, our customers opportunities to grow their businesses. That's helpful to understand. Thank you. So Forage was your first venture as CEO, is that right? Yes. And now Adapt is, is your second. So what are you learning in terms of leadership and how has that changed over the years? And, you know, just kind of bringing us to present day, what are some of the, the ahas, some of the challenges you're coming across um, as you grow this company? I think the biggest learning has been managing emotions. That's one big thing. At Stryker, you know, you're a lone wolf. You're a sales rep. You're out there, right? Yeah. And so if something goes wrong and you get in your car and you're like, oh, like, I wish that I had won that deal or something like that, yeah. you can you can express that because you're expressing it yourself. When you're managing a team that permeates through the culture of the organization. And so just understanding how to recognize what's an emergency, what's not an emergency, right? And I'll have like things come up and, you know, to me, it's like, this is not a big deal. We'll solve that problem. We'll we'll cross that hurdle. It's like water off a duck's back. And then for the team members, it's like, oh my goodness, like how do we solve this? And so becoming a leader and giving them that 
kind of calming factor has been something that I've been actively learning and trying to get better and better for. I'm also willing to do whatever it takes to win. So like if I need to go in nights and weekends and scrub a floor, I'm going to do that, right? I'll never ask our team to do something that I haven't done. Our container, when we first launched our first containers in Ottawa and Toronto, I was running them nights and weekends when I wasn't, you know, doing my day-to-day stuff. Um, And I did that for months, right? Delivering to, to chefs, delivering to restaurants, making sure the model worked before we took the risk of hiring somebody and and then being responsible for their daily income and you know their their career. So now that we're in market, now that we're expanding, it's like the challenges that they're seeing I've, I've already seen, right? I can already and so I can give them that learning. So I'm a lead from the front type of leader. I'm a so that's that's what I'm doing. And in this stage of company, I think there's multiple stages of a company. Like we're in the marine phase. Like we are groundwork, like in the trenches, we need to like grind it out. And that's really where I think that from a a leadership perspective, that's where my strengths lie. If we get so big that uh, it's more of a kind of maintain, might not be the right person because we're always going to try to drive for growth, always going to try to drive for bigger and better. Where do you draw inspiration from? I'm a big sports guy. And so I apologize if I've been using like cliches because I I grew up with the post-game interviews of hockey players like pucks in deep and just got to get pucks on the net. But I just, I try to be the best version of myself and I try to look at how big things can get and how much we can do from inside first. I can't remember where I heard the quote. It wasn't mine, but choose your heart, right? Reward or regret. And I'm trying to choose reward every single day and try to focus on know, how I can make the most of my time. So if you're not drawing inspiration from inside, like that's, it's going to be challenging to to go hard every day. Have you had mentors in the past that have inspired you or that you've learned from? Yeah, my first boss out of school, kind of a polarizing figure now, but he founded Canopy Growth Corp. And so, you know, multi-billion dollar cannabis company and just having seen his progression from working in startups to being, you know, a global leading company, again, going back, call back to previous times in this podcast is like, if you see someone do it, you feel like you can, it's a possibility for you, right? A lot of the times, like you're looking at these people like, oh my goodness, like they must have something that I don't, right? They must just know something that everybody's just a person, right? And it's just a matter of applying effort and learning and skills. And so I knew him from working in the office next to him, you know, being an intern and making Valentine's Day cards for his kids' elementary school, right? To the point where he's running a multi, multi-billion dollar organization. It's like, well, if he can do that, like, I think I've, I can build the confidence up to build something great. So from there, for sure. It's an important point to see folks that have done something. It sort of just shows you what's possible. It's kind of like the banister with the four minute mile, whatever. You know, once he did it, it was like, oh, it can be done. And just <laughs> within the next, I think, couple of months, people were breaking it left and right. It's, it's interesting how much of a mental shift that is. Exactly. And that and like goes back to the, the tech center and, and kind of environment in Ottawa is like you see a couple companies achieve that. A lot more people are willing to take that risk. And so that's thankfully I saw that early on in my career and I was able to eventually get to the point where I was willing to take that risk myself. You manufacture your own containers, is that correct? Yes. Yes, we do. Ooh, that was a big learning <laughs> curve, Harry. Like, you know, we received our first prototypes and, you know, the first one came a month late and the third one came seven months late. And even before they arrived, we were like, wow, this could be a completely crippling factor to the business. We need to solve this. And so we launched a manufacturing facility out in Delta, BC, and the team there is producing our containers in-house. I think there's a, a multitude of reasons why that provides an advantage for us, right? Like we, we've lived through the challenges of like getting a container farm and it not working, right? Wow. And like, what do you do, right? You just need, you don't have the option of like, okay, I give up, let me send it back. It's like, we just need to figure it out. Right. And so every time we've reached a point where it's like, this isn't working, we need to figure it out. That's a learning that we have. And so we've gone through, we've seen those hurdles so that now when we deploy a farm, we know that it'll work. We know that once we plug it in, this will operate. And then as we find opportunities to improve, we can do it on the fly. Right. So really like we're 
we're probably on design iteration like 17 by now, just like little tweaks here and there, right? Like let's move the operating room a little bit bigger. Let's create a, a backup for gravity power instead of forced water. Let's, how do we do this to make sure that we're incrementally better every single time? And then obviously the cost, uh, you know, savings and operational expenses and capital expenses associated with that uh, help us tremendously for deployment. I it wouldn't be a discussion around expenses if we didn't talk about power, <laughs> electricity, how that's a big factor that's talked about a lot in the in the ag tech space. And I'm wondering how you think about those challenges in terms of expenses, managing that to the extent that you can. I'm going to throw out some numbers here, Harry, and you're going to like, you're not going to believe me, right? Our 40 foot unit here in Ottawa is averaging 10 kilowatt hours a day, right? Like it's pennies, pennies a day for operation of this container in the middle of a harsh winter. Like we've gone through a polar vortex where it went down to minus 40 degrees Celsius and it still kept chugging, like no crop loss. And so we don't require a tremendous amount of lighting infrastructure that, you know, leafy green container would. We can operate on a small panel, like 60 amp panel. And so it's a very unique st structure of operating containers that is different than other uh, sectors in ag tech, right? So much so that we have a real estate partner that we work with called Reef Technologies that owns and operates, you know, thousands of ghost kitchens everywhere. Like we're using less power for our farms than a food truck. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. So for us, power is such a non-issue that like it's included in our rent uh, for, <laughs> for these parking lots. That's awesome. So we talked a little bit about the ag tech space. We were connected through the team at Cultivated. And I'm wondering what your experience has been as you start to, I don't know if you've made it to conferences or if you've kind of seen the bigger space of what's happening. I'm just curious about your thoughts, if you've started to build relationships or have conversations with some of your colleagues. So I know the team at, at Cultivated Well, they're awesome guys. And I think that if someone is looking to get into vertical farming and they don't know where to start, like that's a great group to start with, right? Because they'll help you understand what your limitations are, what your city what capacity you can have, what the financial in investment's going to be. And they've had experiences with projects all around the world. Great place to start. So I've got a great relationship with them. I'm going to get a little bit out there a little bit more. I am a, you know, let's put my head down. I don't, I don't like to be the type of person that asks for credit for work not done. And I just want to grind and deliver a tangible product. And I'm also balancing that reality distortion versus paranoia feeling where if you've read the Steve Jobs book, right, they said he's got this reality distortion field around him is like, I need a little bit of that to, you know, convince myself that I can do anything right and build this, but then balancing that paranoia of like, I'm not working hard enough, right? I need to keep grinding. Like I can't take a couple of days off and go to a conference. I need to launch another container, right? And so yeah. there's another adage of like lazy people do a little bit of work and they think they should be winning and then winning people work really hard and think that they're still being lazy. Like, I think that I always feel like I'm not doing enough, but we'll get out there and, and meet some folks. That's good. What's a tough question you've had to ask yourself recently? Can I stay focused? The, another adage, here's the, uh, the post-game interview uh, <laughs> in me. Like the biggest threat to a good idea is another good idea. Mm, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so we grow and we sell mushrooms. We're doing a lot of other things, right? We, we, but we grow and we sell mushrooms. And like, we definitely need to stay focused on, on driving revenue, maintaining our really strong unit economics. But then there's like these little things that keep pulling at me. It's like, yeah, but you could do this, right? And you can, you can also do this. And how do we allocate enough time to explore those? And we don't feel like we've missed out on those opportunities while still maintaining focus and growing the business and achieving the results that we've made commitments to achieve. So like that's been one of the biggest challenges, I think, is just staying focused. But so far, so good. So we're having this conversation 12 months from now. What would need to happen with your progress for you to be happy that you're on the right path? It's the journey is the happiness, Harry. <laughs> I try to, take, <laughs> try to take joy in every day. There's ups and there's downs. It's not, yeah, I'm not looking for a destination. I do have obviously corporate goals that we want to achieve, but you know, we're making progress every single day. The slow is smooth, smooth is fast. And if we can avoid as many, mis like as, as many mistakes as possible, then that's a win for me. 
especially right now when there is the potential to change the mindset to be in the big company mindset, right? Like, let's try to be a big company. It's the opposite of what I want to do. I want to create a series of startups within a startup, right? That have that mentality of have that grind mentality, scrappiness. That's what I want to maintain. And if we, 12 months from now, all cylinders are firing and everybody has that mentality, I'd be very happy. That's a great answer. Thanks. So as we wrap up, I've been leaving a little bit of time at the end of these interviews for you because of the nature of these conversations. It's a lot of your colleagues, your peers in the space, folks in ag tech. Is there a message? Is there anything you have you want to say or share with folks in the space? I think the important thing as a whole for the space is to ensure that, and this is going to go off a little bit, is that the public side of ag tech catches up as quickly as the private side. So you have all these amazing founders that you're having on your podcast that are doing these incredible things. And something that listeners might be shocked about, or maybe they're not, is that when we try to do new things, we have a big stop sign in front of us from you know governments, municipalities, all that stuff that are saying, no, 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 this is different. You can't do that. And we're, we need to change that mindset because we need solutions like this, right? And instead of putting up red tape, instead of putting up uh, barriers for companies to do interesting things, is like we need to ensure that they're supporting these initiatives. So that's kind of my biggest message is if there's opportunities from a municipal level, from a state level, from a province level, federal level to support indoor ag, as a listener, as a consumer, it's very important to support those because if not, then, then they just the decisions won't be made, right? Because if a decision's made and if it's not the right one, you know, a politician can be exited. So help them make that decision. People want this. People want these products. People want fresh, um, safe products to market. So if there's any way to help influence that, it's important. If there's, you know, a municipality listening to the podcast, reach out. If you honestly, Harry, if a municipality says you've got the green light to operate a container in our city, like we'll, we'll put that at the top of the list right? Red tape is definitely a barrier in a lot of different places. I keep that in mind for Minneapolis as well. <laughs> so I guess final question, what's your big picture, like big reason for why you do what you do? We're trying to advance access to sustainable food. Um, that's the mission of the company. And we are, we're supported from impact funds, um, which is awesome because they believe that that's the ultimate goal. What that impact is, isn't always CO2 emissions. And for us, it's, you know, really hyper local community impact. We are averaging zero spo food spoilage because if we overgrow, we're donating to community kitchens and food banks. So not only are, do we have, you know, space in our containers to grow and sell and be a commercial enterprise and make money for sure, but we're also reserving portions of those grows to donate, right? Because if someone can't, you know, eat at the most expensive restaurant in the city or shop at even the, the you know, a mainstay retailer and they're servicing food banks, they deserve access to this product and this food as well. So at Adapt, that's what we're, we're really focused on is advancing access to that sustainable food. And then separate from the corporate mission, I want to get more people into agriculture, right? There's a lot of companies that are robotics this and let's get people out and let's eliminate that personal touch from, from agriculture. I'm, I get it, like unit economics, you know, economies of scale, but the more people coming into agriculture, the better. If we can create something that is not as scary for operators, right? It's not huge technology and like all these things you need to learn to get them in the door. I think that's a, a big win for us. Because whether they start out as a mushroom farmer for us and eventually get to the point where they're confident enough to, you know, take over a dairy farm in the local region, right? Like where we need people that are willing to jump into that industry in food production is there is no succession plan for a lot of these, these industries, right? Average age, Canadian farmer, 55, 56 years old, kids aren't wanting to get into the, the local and the, the family business. Like, what are we going to do? We still need that, that milk. We still need those eggs, right? Let's find more people and let's give them more avenues uh, into the industry. 
That's a perfect way to wrap up the conversation. Thanks for sharing your insights. I appreciate you sharing your journey. It's really inspiring to see all the different ways people make it into this space. And I think it's easier to see looking back how the, the decisions you made and all the experiences you had led to you where you are now. And I think during your time at Striker or even in banking, I don't know that you would know that this is where you were headed, but you were putting the pieces in place, building the relationships, having the experiences and setting you up for success in terms of what you're doing now. So I really like, thank you for sharing that. It's really inspiring to hear everything that, that, that you've got in place. And I'm, and I'm wishing you tons of success for Adapt. Awesome. Thanks, Harry. Really appreciate it. And thanks all the listeners for listening and, and reach out website adapt.ag or go to foragehyperfoods.com vertical 20 get yourself some products. Yeah, we'll make sure all those links are available in the show notes. And so if people have any questions, they, they know where to reach out to us. Awesome. Thanks again to Jonathan for taking time out of his super busy day to share his story and the Adapt Ag Tech story with us. Really fascinating. I love that conversation. As always, full show notes available at verticalfarmingpodcast.com. Summaries, timestamps, key takeaways, resources mentioned in this show. Please check that out if you haven't done so already. Podcast production and marketing provided by Fullcast. Learn more at fullcast.co to see if a podcast is right for you. Special thanks to our Season 8 title sponsor, Cultivated. If you're looking into a vertical farm and don't know where to start or which technology would suit your needs, reach out to them today. And best of all, their service is free because they work on behalf of their partners. Learn more at cultivated.com, and that's spelled C-U-L-T-I-V-A-T-D.com. Just leave out that last E. As a reminder, if you enjoyed this show or past episodes, please leave us a rating and a review at ratethispodcast.com forward slash VFB. And nothing would please me more than to read that out on a future episode. The hits keep on coming. Next episode, another fascinating conversation with a little bit of what's happening on the ground in Las Vegas. After my follow-up at Indoor AgCon, and you heard me mention the experience I had visiting the local food deserts here, I'm really excited to bring you the story of Alaric Overbay and the work they're doing at Greenside Up. Until we meet again, here's to your health. Thanks for listening. To read the full show notes for this episode, which includes any links mentioned in the episode, as well as a full show transcription, visit verticalfarmingpodcast.com. There, you can sign up for our email list to be notified when new episodes are published.